abbreviation for us. Yeah, okay, so uh, it is five seconds to four. So <laughs> thank you all for coming. Um, it is a pleasure to have today uh, Dr. George Ricker as our colloquium speaker. And he has a one page long curriculum. So usually I try to memorize these things, but you know, I really had to go and highlight the parts of it that were the most impressive to me. Um, so George is not only the PI of TESS, as we all know now, but he's also the director of the detector lab at the MIT and a senior research scientist at the MIT Gasly Institute. He was the PI of the uh, International High Energy Transient Explorer 2, HETI 2, which was the first satellite dedicated to GRBs, just, just to follow up GRBs and to find them, I guess. Um, he was also the PI of the CCD Solid State Imaging, or CIS, a spectrometer on the Japan U US ASCA mission. And he was the deputy PI of the Advanced CCD Imaging Spectrometer uh, on Chandra, as many of you here are familiar with. This is just a few highlights. Um, Science-wise, um, George is interested in exoplanets and high energy transients. Um, uh, phenomena and follow-up, and uh, uh, he could talk to us about many of those things, but what he's going to talk to us today is um, the, the state, you know, the, the, the state of the test mission that was launched a year ago. So thank you, George. Thank you. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here and to see uh, so many uh, old friends and, uh, and colleagues um, over the long period of time that we've actually we've actually been old. Yeah, I, I should call that <laughs> old a little bit because we're all in that state now, or at least getting some. Um, and, but the other thing I wanted to uh, relate just as a, um, a, a little comment about you know, how TESS came to be, because I was reminded when we were having some conversations before. This actually, the, 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 uh, I'll cover a little bit more of the history in a, in a few minutes, but the actual origin of many of the ideas related to TESS uh, actually came from the fact that uh, Ginger Latham and my wife are, are both involved in the Mass Medical Society. So Dave Latham and I would oftentimes go to these dinners and conversations and then we would be sitting over completely lost in terms of what the physicians were saying and we started talking about astronomy and some of the things that he was interested in and some of the things that, that I was interested in. This was back in the and the Heady 2 era, and that was that really were some of the first uh, conceptual ideas that we had that were uh, that were related to tests. And then, uh, the, and over the last uh, 15 years, uh, these have all been part of the picture that has really uh, led us to work uh, tests is currently. Let's see, I've got. It. So anyway, this this image, there's small print down at the bottom. If I can find the pointer. So I'll just have to do that. Anyway, this uh, this group. Can you see it here? Oh, that's it. Okay, cool. All right. So the um, this list of, of people and organizations uh, down in this section um, are the members of of uh, the the. Uh, original contributors to Tess's ideas and, and, and as it has, has developed. And, and this, this group, uh, along specifically with this, this particular group, these are the engineers and managers who were involved in Tess. But all together, from the time we were actually selected for flight by NASA in 2013, there's been more than a million person hours that have been um, devoted to the things that I'll be talking about today. And in fact, the uh, the leadership of the of the panel uh, of the of the mission is actually are the five folks that are shown here. This is the so-called science council that has uh, has actually been very active in the in, since, since we've launched. And I wanted to say thanks to all the people in this in this block here uh, who've been the leaders for the test science office and the test uh, object of interest identification. Of, uh, protocols who really contributed to the materials that I'm showing you today. So the uh, basic idea behind TESS um, is that we have had as a primary goal to um, examine the uh, a very large uh, solid angle in the sky 
and really look for the best uh, uh, small exoplanets. Now, best in this sense means that you can actually do uh, characterization. Uh, that's something that means that you want to be looking at uh, um, at uh, bright host stars in the solar neighborhood, and and with the end goal that you know these aren't just going to be uh, objects that you see a transit light curve, and that, and that's of course the basic mechanism that we're talking about. <coughs> But you will also uh, be able to do follow-up characterization, which has been a real challenge for the thousands of, of planets that are known from the Kepler survey. And then, of course, looking forward, we're thinking in terms of what can be done over the coming decade for future missions, including Webb. So basically, the survey itself, which was really focused on the needs for exoplanet work, is what's shown in this block here. We were going to uh, look for sun-like stars, uh, down to about 12th magnitude, uh, all the M dwarfs that we could find out to 200 light years, and then uh, observe in two different ways. We would identify for two minute um, measurements uh, the stars that we knew would be interesting, but also to provide full frame <coughs> images with every single star uh, in all of, the, uh, in all of the, the exposures that we made and bring that data down every 30 minutes. So the history uh, uh, tests had a, a long history of uh, growing on from those conversations which uh, Dave and I had uh, back at, when we were uh, sitting aboard at, our, at what our wives were discussing. Uh, this, is the, th this was one of the first ideas that came about. Uh, this was very much influenced by uh, HETI-2. Uh, we didn't have a good acronym, so we, we sort of made up one. Uh, it was the Hot Exoplanet uh, Transit Experiment survey, so it was a little contrived, but this was something that we put forward in 2006. We did this uh, as, as basically an activation of, a, of, of the satellite for another purpose, uh, repurposing the satellite, and uh, NASA, in its wisdom, turned that down. Uh, and then we said, okay, we're going to go off and do this in a really cheap, uh, quick way by looking for private funding. And so both MIT and, and uh, an SAO uh, attempted to find donors who would help us with this. This was all in a period of time in 2006 and 2007 when the markets were doing great. There were lots of people who had uh, a lot of money and we had people lined up and then came 2008, so that really didn't, didn't help us at all. So then what we, we decided is, okay, we're going to go back to the more traditional way of doing this. And there was an opportunity for um, a small explorer proposal uh, to be put forward in uh, December of 2008, and then so we proposed for that. And uh, one of the things that those with sharp eyes can see is this idea that we had right here. This had ten cameras, uh, or sorry, eight cameras in it. And now, by the time we, we were going to do this in a, in a formal NASA way, the number had shrunk to six. And then, so when that that was accepted for a phase A, uh, but it was not selected for flight. So then we went to a, a mid-ex explorer. And even though there was a lot more money and resources, the number of cameras had shrunk to four. And so we're very happy that we got in at that level because we could see that number, that series was rapidly approaching zero. So, Okay, so the way that TESS actually uh, fits in to the NASA scheme of things is it's, it's really the bridge between Kepler and Webb, uh, especially in the sense that you know, uh, Kepler has done a marvelous job of of doing uh, statistical surveys and telling us really that exoplanets are extremely common. And then TESS, is I the idea behind TESS is that it will, uh, 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 it will provide the, the suitable targets for web. And uh, so you know, when we launched in 2018, uh, that's really a, a nice uh, segue into the 2021. When we first started TESS, we had a little little challenge with this argument because they were supposed to launch a lot before we did, but somehow that all worked out. So, so there. So coming back to this question of where do you point Webb? Well, this is the this is the idea. I mean, every every ground-based telescope needs a finder, so we're the finder for TESS for for JWST. So this is another uh, comparison that actually shows some of the key characteristics of. Uh, Kepler um, and uh, and TESS and why it's different and why it's doing different things. So if you if you look at the, uh, at two of the lines in this plot, um, the field of view and the uh, optical area, and then you calculate the etendue, 
it turns out that that test actually is about six times greater than Kepler. And this is primarily because both, uh, both missions have very efficient uh, optical systems. TESS has a small area, uh, Kepler had a large area, but in terms of the field of view, we're talking about something like 20 plus times the larger field of view, and that's what ultimately weighs out. So in a survey, you know, Etandu is always an important factor to, to take into account. Um, the, as we were getting the mission going in 2014, when we, when we actually had the, uh, the KDPC, which is the transition to, to actual flight, we had to, to, uh, to tell NASA, um, try to be as quantitative as we could about how the follow-up program was going to be. And so they asked Dave and me and, and Josh Wynn to, to actually predict what was going to happen when we actually had the positions for test uh, objects in terms of how long was it going to have, uh, was it going to be so before we could establish 50 measured masses uh, for small planets. And this is the way small planets are actually defined. So this includes uh, Earths and super Earths and, su and sub-Neptunes, and that was, that was the way it was defined because for larger planets, a lot of them could be readily established on the ground, so the motivation for a space-based space -based mission was not so great. So th anyway, this is what we, what we came up with. So uh, over the period of time for 36 months, which was uh, the combination of, of phase E and phase F, where we would be able to make observations and, and do follow-up work with it, uh, we were expecting to be, um, we're, we're, well, sort of along here. So here we are today according to this plot. And according to this plot, we should have had zero measured masses as of today. Um, and in reality, we're here. So we have 19, and so we're, in that sense, seven months ahead of schedule, which is, which is really a, a good, a good it's, it's much better to be that way than the other way around. So, so that's, one, that's one really uh, uh, auspicious thing for the mission, the way that it's going. I mentioned before that it has a very large field of view, and 2,300 square degrees is 6% of the entire sky. So that, that means that the way that you're actually going to look at it at a test image in comparison to a lot of other things that have been done. Uh, this is an actual image from one of the cameras and uh, the field of view from this one camera out of the four, thank goodness we have four, um, is 24 degrees on a side. And there are four CCDs within that and for comparison, uh, you know, you could fit 10,000 moons uh, in the field of view and then uh, this is the Kepler field of view, which fits within one of the 16 CCDs that we had. And then the other uh, instruments that are coming up that have also wide fields and high heat undo, LSST and uh, ZTF uh, are, are here. And what TESS actually does is you get an image like this and, and three others um, with a 30-minute cadence, um, and we get 1,300 successive images like this for every orbit. And, with, and, they, and, they, and as I'll show you later on, these go all the way from, from first and second magnitude stars down to objects as faint as 20th magnitude that we're able to actually detect with the system. And then this, this is a cartoon that actually shows the fact that we're looking at the whole, at all sky and, and Kepler was only looking at, able to look at a quarter of a percent. Of course, in the K2 mission, uh, it looked at a, a much larger fraction of the sky than that, but that was the, that was the primary mission. So to get an idea of what this really means in terms of, of the um, predicted distance and directions to test planets, this is an animation that was prepared by uh, Zach Berta. And when I run it, you'll actually see what, we, what happens as you move uh, gradually out from the, um, from the solar neighborhood in terms of where you expect to have uh, planets come in. And there, uh, there, this is a, 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 an animation that was made uh, some months ago, so it does. It has a few of the of the test planets on it, but not all. So this is what it looks like. Um, in, if you're close in, the code on this is that uh, the orange dots are predicted, and and the red are are discovered uh, uh, test uh, planets. And then there uh, there are a few others that are in here that are that have also been discovered um, uh, by other uh, missions or 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 by ground-based work. Whoops. Let me go back. So there we go. So then uh, as you move in, as you move out actually, uh, you see more and more of the orange dots. You get into an area where there are, uh, 
Let me do this right. Okay, sorry. Um, as you go, as you move further out, you you find that uh, there is a um, a regime in which there are many uh, test planets, and then as you move further and further out, you see that real spray that's going off to the upper left, where you have the uh, all of the Kepler planets. But it's all, but it's basically all tests all the time in the in the in the intermediate area, and that was of course the way the mission was designed to be. So this is what uh, test actually looks like when it's uh, uh, when it was being prepared uh, for launch. You can see those. Those four cameras here. This is a uh, this is basically a sunshade around the outside, and uh, the panels are the only deployable system. And then it uses a KA band dish that actually can operate at 100 megabits per second. So we're basically limited uh, because of the uh, the way the system utilizes the deep space network by the actual uh, maximum rate that the DSN can operate at. If we if the DSN had more Capability, we could actually operate at a gigabit per second, but we we're, st we're we're limited to what they currently have. So this is what uh, the fairing that Tess lived uh, in while we were doing the preparations down at uh, at Cape Canaveral. And if you if you look at what it looks like inside, it's it's a it's quite a quite a large uh, uh, structure. You can put a school bus inside. And, and for relative scale, that's what test looks like in this. So we used to joke within the team that we didn't even really need to fold the solar panels. We could just deploy them and wouldn't have to even worry about it. But there were vibration problems associated with that, so we never did it. So the, uh, the thing, that when you actually look at the hardware, this is the adapter cone that goes down to the second stage of the rocket. And then this is the, this is the, this is the fairing along the side. Um, and then... This is the, uh, that's, that's test itself. You can see really how tiny it is in comparison. It's, it's not all that tiny. It's about as tall as I am, and it weighs about 300 kilograms. So it's not, it's not a, it, it is small, but not, not ridiculously the way that it looks here. So anyway, the thing that we were then uh, uh, set up to do would be to uh, actually carry out the launch. Uh, we made a launch attempt on April 16th last year. And then finally, there was a there was a uh, a, uh, a problem that that the people on the on the launcher wanted to go back and check again. So then, two days later, we got this to happen. And then stage one is at startup pressures. T minus fifteen seconds. Falcon nine is configured for flight. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. The ground really does shake when you're there. So that's, that's, this, this is on the platform of, you know, from a camera that was three miles away. So pretty amazing. Stage one propulsion is nominal. So anyway, that was uh, that was you know there were goosebumps and excitement and all that, but this is the part that I think was really to me a lot more exciting when this uh, series of events happened. If I do this right, this is 45 minutes later. We're over uh, Australia, and then this happens, and it's fantastic. And then that's that you can still see, you can see that dark area, which is the K band dish, which has that uh, cover on it, and it drifts away. And then we're we're on our way. Uh, the thing that we then have to do is go through a series of maneuvers to get us into the into the right orbit, and this is what uh, basically was involved there. We launched from Cape Canaveral. We we went east and then and then south uh, at 28 degrees, and then we uh, injected from the second stage over Australia, and then we went into this phasing orbit, which took us out uh, initially a little over uh, 275,000 kilometers, and then we looped back, and each time we uh, we approached the Earth. There was a, uh, a burn of the hydrazine system uh, on the satellite, and so we did this a couple of times, sort of revving things up, getting ready to go. And then, meanwhile, we were uh, we were waiting for um, the moon to come into the right location. And then, when that happened after this next orbit, um, it, it comes along very uh, very gracefully. And then we we then do a uh, a flyby, 
and use that to change the plane of the orbit. Because when we launched um, initially, if you if you were in the if you just if we just stayed in the ecliptic, we would get a um, an eclipse by the Earth and the and the Moon every month, and there would be problems operating the spacecraft as well as loss in observing time. So this actually tipped the um, inclination of the orbit to 37 degrees, and that was um, that, that was a really um, important result because. One of the things that we relied on was this. We've got, we, we basically were going to take advantage of the three-body problem because we've got, uh, we've got Tess here, the Earth, and the Moon. And then basically what we do is we run, we've, th this orbit is 13.7 days, so it's in resonance with the Moon. So if I do this right, uh, we've got a, play, a position uh, twi uh, twice a month, or, or actually twice an orbit. So the orbit is 13. Uh, uh, days or so, and then so every week we get a, tr a, a an orientation like this where it goes Tess, Earth, Moon, and what happens then is that the uh, the the Moon tugs on the orbit and pulls it down in this direction, and then we let it go um, another another uh, another whoops, I say do this right. Uh, I see K J. All right, so anyway, technical problem here. So what happens is it, it comes around again, and it tugs in the other direction. So the net, the net result is that the, the orbit will sort of oscillate back and forth a little bit, and, um, but, it, but it's, it's a controlled oscillation, and you can stay in this orbit uh, in with, the, with this uh, elliptical configuration where you're coming in close to the Earth at... Uh, uh, at perigee, but you're out at uh, uh, at apogee um, uh, for most of the observing time, and so then if you do this correctly, uh, let's see. Looks like I've oh I see what happened. I dropped out. Okay, so there we go. Okay, so what what happens then is is the following. Uh, you got if you look at the schedule. This is when we launched. These oscillations, basically, the eight or nine year period, that's actually the, co the COSI interaction. And then these finer scales are when the Earth and the, and the uh, sorry, the Moon and the Earth are, are tugging alternately and, and toward each other. So that's, a, that's another perturbation that we had to worry about. And if you actually look at, at what, what happens, then uh, we, we stabilize, we're stable with respect to COSI oscillations, and that was what was planned. And then over this period of time, we end up basically staying above the, the, this red line here is not only the time uh, marker, but it also shows where the geosynchronous belt is. So we stay above the geosynchronous belt. That's required by international regulation. And yet we, we, we continue to come into this relatively close ap approximation. And we also stay above the radiation belts, which are, which are in the three or four uh, RE difference. And as a result of the careful targeting that was actually done, we started out with 40 kilograms of hydrazine. We used 30 kilograms for that orbit adjust in the beginning. And what's actually left is enough for 300 years of operations. So we have to use the, the, a little bit of the hydrazine to do uh, moment, angular momentum control uh, with the reaction wheels in the satellite. So the things that you get for free, in a sense, out of this orbit is, is what's, what's shown here. You're well away from the Earth almost all the time, so you get 300 hours of unobscured viewing. And the other thing is, is that um, this is something we didn't know how good it would be. The thermal stability is, a, is of the order of a millikelvin per hour. So once you've focused your optics and, and have control of the, uh, the electronics, the, it's, it's far more stable than you could get if you were in a, a vacuum uh, control system with thermal stabilization uh, at, a, at any ground-based telescope. And the stray light level, you're, you're away from the Earth most of the time in the, in the range uh, that, that you're uh, near apogee, you're outside the radiation belts. But the other thing that you get are these really high downlink rates because we can use the deep space network, which can't be used for, for low Earth uh, um, missions because of the tracking uh, rates that are required. So in so anyway, th so once we got into this, we knew we had a mission, and we had and we then had to f had to basically figure out what to do to make the instrument work 
really well, and we spent three months uh, doing that. Um, and one of the things also that we did is we made sure that at the time we entered the orbit, we knew when the, there would be some eclipses by the Earth of the Moon, but there's, no, there's none that last more than, a, than an hour or two for the next 20 years. Um, then we have batteries to cover that. And the, but the instruments are really, really working extremely well. And the spacecraft uh, also works well. Uh, we, the pointing jitter is, is 20, it's about like Hubble, uh, and it's a thousandth of a pixel. So that means not only is the system operating very stably, but we, we also, the, the, the fact that there's less jitter means that there's a noise term that doesn't impact the actual photometric precision that we can, uh, that we can at attend. And this is a plot that actually shows that. This is, uh, this is test magnitude uh, in this range uh, versus the uh, one hour uh, photometric precision that you get along this axis. And this is just, these are just uh, a random collection of stars that have been looked at um, and our requirement was to be at 230 parts per million in, in an hour at 10th magnitude, and uh, we were actually, we, we were under that, and then uh, more so at, at the, we, had, we, had, we hadn't known how well it was going to behave, so we assumed that it would be around 60 parts per million for uh, errors that were basically unknown unknowns, but in reality we're around, uh, we're below 20 parts per million. So that's the the, this, this is the way the mission has really surprised us by providing such exquisite performance photometrically, and that, that'll show in some of the things I'm going to share with you in a minute. So after commissioning, we started the survey last July, and this actually shows, this uh, animation just shows how we carried out the survey. There are the fields of view of the four cameras um, splayed out on the sky, extending from the ecliptic all the way up to the... Uh, to the ecliptic poles, and we actually planned the mission so that we had one camera that's always focused on the uh, ecliptic pole. And we started out in the, in the south, so this is the south ecliptic pole, and then uh, for the first year, which we'll be finishing up uh, in July this year, then we sw we're going to uh, switch over and then uh, tile the north in the same way. So if we do this, uh, this is what we end up with. This, these are the fields of view of the cameras. And this is that stepping process as we move around. And then if you look at what this means, this is that mapping that you saw in the animation, 13 sectors in the south, 13 sectors in the north. And then uh, when you're done, this is the way the tiling on the sky actually turns out. Well, this is the continuous viewing zone, which is accessible at any time for observations by Webb or WFIRST or any of the future missions that are, that are planned. Uh, uh, that'll primarily be out at, at, at L2. And then, the, but with this, this special area of, of approximately 600 degrees, we can look at that for 351 days, and then the other areas, as you move closer to the ecliptic pl uh, plane, uh, you, you, uh, you get down to about 27 days for this last camera down at the bottom. So this is the first, uh, we, this, you know, I mentioned the full frame images, and this is one of 1,200 that we got in the first light image. And um, we, this, is the, uh, the, this is the way it's actually arrayed on the sky itself. This is the camera that's actually pointed at the camera, we call, which we call camera four. That's the uh, LMC. So the, lar the Large Magellanic Cloud, in that camera, as the year goes on, it just, it just orbits around and stays within the same camera all the time. So that was, that was another bonus that we got. And then there's a lot of other uh, objects that, are, that you can see that are in here, there's the, the SMC is there, uh, uh, as well as a number of, um, of characteristic, uh, uh, nice, nice bright stars to look at. Some of these stars are, are, are uh, between first and second magnitude, and they, they are, there is blooming along the columns, but we designed the CCDs so that the way that they spill charge, they, the charge doesn't go into the, um, uh, the, the borders between pixels, it actually spreads along the columns in a way that charge is conserved, and that's that's a really good thing. So this is the this is the way the mapping actually goes. This was that first sector starting out at the end of, end of July, and then we just went around like that. So this is what it looks like in uh, ecliptic uh, coordinates. If you go to celestial coordinates, this is what it looks like, and I put the uh, st the planets uh, that's from other surveys that have previously been flown, and one of the uh, previously been discovered. And one of the things that we actually got was we got a little bonus uh, from sectors four through eight, 
where the northern hemisphere uh, observers could get in, so into into the uh, activity. So we've had identifications already made uh, for the northern hemisphere as well as the southern hemisphere. So this is what you get if you look at that um, that fourth camera. This is what it looks like when you lay it out on the sky. There's there's the uh, there's the the LMC and the SMC, and then here you can see the ecliptic plane. Uh, the pixel size for tests is 20 arc seconds. So that means that in really dense star regions, you can't uh, readily resolve um, uh, the, 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 the stars one from another. But there are a number of tricks when you get a wet, you know, up to maybe 10 degrees or so away from the ecliptic plane, from the galactic plane, where you can start to uh, make these resolutions because now we have such a stable platform and with a uh, with a catalog like uh, you, you have from Gaia DR2 you know where all the individual stars are therefore you can deconvolve their positions this is the same sort of thing that's been done for the Sloan Digital Sky Survey going down to its ultimate limiting magnitude so those are things that we're actually working with now to push things even further now there's another thing that actually we saw uh, when we looked this is a uh, 10 square degree field out of 2,300 square degrees uh, looking um, in one of the early sectors and there's 530 minute exposures and so it's about 250 hours. And one of the things that we, that we saw was we, we saw that uh, when you let it, when let, you let the animation run, you can see there's stars that are blinking. Uh, those are variable stars I mean, below 1,000 parts per million almost every star has some type of variability. You see these little black, black uh, dots racing around, those are asteroids. And this was not a, pl a plane, a, a camera that was pointed at the plane. So we're starting to see really faint asteroids. There's been more than a thousand or so that we've detected. They're a little bit of a nuisance because you end up, they, um, they end up sometimes falsifying a, uh, uh, a signature that could be a transient especially um, and then the other thing that you also see, people, this, I think this will, this will loop again. You see that there's a little shadow on the on the stars. That's due to velocity aberration as we're moving around the orbit, because this is median filtered by doing frame subtraction. And when you do that, you get that that the the, the it changes a little bit as it as it moves around. So that's so that was that was interesting. It was kind of um, uh, a little bit um, well. It was it was pro it was something we had to, we had to worry about more than we thought we had because uh, you know we were surprised by the asteroids but you know there's there's a um, there are a number of people who are, who are interested in these there have been some uh, neos that have been cataloged already that we that we've seen and you can see things like binary asteroids and you, you know the rotation curves and there's a lot of things that can be can be done with the data so I'll so I'll spend a little time now talking about exoplanets and some of the early discoveries. And what I'd like to do right at the outset is to thank this uh, incredibly dedicated team at uh, uh, SAO and at MIT who were actually uh, charged with the responsibility of looking at this incredible volume of data um, and then trying to figure out what's a, if there are, are, are dips in the data, uh, are they planets, are they, are, are they some sort of an artifact, and initially uh, we, the tools that we've had were, were best done by um, educated eyes, uh, where some of this is being uh, automated, the triage part of it now is being done with um, with some AI methods that we're using. But initially, this is the group, that, and uh, and Sam Quinn was one of the stalwarts in this, and the other names are are in this list as well. Uh, jo Joey was around, and I know he's he had something to to do with this, and so it, it, essentially everyone has sort of pitched in and helped um, in this process. Um, and then the other thing is the follow-up observing program. This is the responsibility that uh, SAO has under the under the program, and um, this is a slide that uh, that Sam put together. We're in the southern hemisphere, so we've got a lot of telescopes that are that are doing uh, reconnaissance spectroscopy, uh, photometric checking of uh, of, of uh, transits uh, to the to the extent that that's sometimes possible for certainly for larger planets as well as preparing the way to do precision radio velocity work, which is what, what is how you get the masses. And uh, so these, these uh, uh, five locations in the south, they've been, uh, they've been very busy uh, preparing for this. And um, 
so basically, this is uh, these are, are the numbers in, term, in terms of some of the things that we've seen. And you can really see that when we flip over to the, uh, to the north, everybody's going to be really, really busy in this, in this block. So people who are on tax are going to certainly see the, uh, the, the impact of this. So there are 38 planet masses that have been uh, 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 established already. This includes uh, giant planets as well as those that satisfy the level one requirements. So, th so then, in terms of, of actual planets, uh, this is the first one. This is, this is a, again, that camera for the South Ecliptic Pole and the LMC, uh, uh, as it were. And then if you look in this upper right-hand corner, there's a fifth magnitude star, Pi Mense. And this was one that we, we actually ha sort of had a clue that there might be something there because there had already been one planet that had been discovered uh, back in 2001 by radio velocity uh, efforts. And uh, it was a, quite an interesting object. It was, it's in a highly eccentric orbit that brings it all the way uh, in from the orbit of, of, of equivalent of Jupiter into, in and through the, the habitable zone. Um, and so you know, there, it was reasonable for us to look. Uh, this was included in the, in the target uh, catalog. And so in, in so doing, we, we kind of knew that there might be something interesting there. So that, that was what we, in fact, found. We found a, um, uh, a super Earth that had a transit depth that was uh, uh, 250 parts per million. And uh, we were able to get a mass uh, fairly quickly for it because of the fact that there had been previous data taken. And then even though that, that large giant uh, planet, that massive giant planet was there, knowing that, that the period and the phase to look the ground-based observers actually were able to see it in, in uh, previously archived data. So that's the point that that, uh, that, that, that planet uh, realized. This was work that was done by Chelsea Wang, who's done a marvelous job as part of the team. The other thing that we saw was uh, there have been, uh, there, 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 have liter I, there are literally scores of slides like this from things that are in the, uh, that are papers that are in preparation that I could show you. This is another one because this is the longest period in the smallest planets that we've seen before. There's, this is a multi-planet system. So actually, it was discovered by TESS, and then we, got, we, we, we cranked up our time machine and, went and did the follow-up based on uh, archive data that was actually available previously. So this is a 36-day uh, period system uh, that's uh, quite massive, but it's, but the, and then the, this one is another planet, and it's really our first Venus-sized planet. So it's slightly smaller than the Earth that was part of that system. And then this is another one. This is associated with that same, with that same system. But this is the paper, uh, uh, this, or, this is an eighth magnitude uh, K-star that uh, uh, Diana Dragomir was uh, the lead for. So in terms of where we knew, um, wh where we stood um, in uh, work that had been done previously in this uh, mass radius plot, this is sort of, these were sort of the best dots, the best, the best measurements that had been made along here. And now with tests already, these are, this is where we're, we're sort of filling in this, this, uh, this search area. So this is all going really well. So the other thing is that TESS has a complete open data process so that we, we process the data as quickly as we can. The TOIs are actually um, uh, alerted to the community uh, in, an, in, in an open way. And there's, a, there's an archive um, that makes the data available as, as quickly as we can. And the, uh, for the follow-up work, uh, as a result of what uh, Karen Collins and, uh, uh, and, and Dave and, and the other folks uh, working, working here have, have done, um, the, 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 the collaboration uh, involves uh, looking, at, uh, looking at, the, uh, uh, at the data at, uh, the way that uh, you know, Sam was shown in, Sam Quinn was shown in some of those early stages, and basically uh, working with the group at the Exoplanet Archive at Nexi, and then making sure that the community of observers actually collaborate rather than compete, so that everyone's not looking at exactly the same candidate. And this has turned out to be absolutely incredible. There's something like 250 or 300 um, ground-based uh, uh, observers who, who are participating in this program. Now, the other thing I'm going to talk about for a little bit is the GI proposal and grants. Um, this is already, we, we had cy uh, cycle one, which actually took place 
before the uh, b before launch. We just completed the preparation for cycle two. Uh, cycle three will be uh, in a year from now. NASA uh, uh, allocates two and a half million dollars in grants annually to this, and this pie chart actually shows the breakdown of what you actually, what the proposals actually, the successful proposals have actually uh, resulted in. The oversubscription factor is about a factor of four. Mostly, a lot of people are doing work on stellar astrophysics, and uh, for um, uh, this number has increased even more in cycle two. These are the cycle one numbers. And then the uh, number of, uh, of uh, extragalactic proposals has doubled from this slide. So there are a lot of people who are who are working with the uh, with the test data, and the data is uh, is archived at MAST at Space Telescope uh, Science Institute, and this is some these are some of the statistics that they've put together in terms of 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 the downloads that they've had and the number of of, of uh, FITS files that they that they've dealt with, and um, one of the things that 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 happened just in the first four days is there were three million downloads and sixty terabytes. And then in the most recent uh, outsets, this sort of word has got, gotten around that the data is of high quality and it's relatively easy to analyze. And the download rates, every time we have a release, it seems to go to a higher and higher number. And right now, the, down, the download rate, um, it, we're, we're, the archive is distributing 10 times as much data as Kepler and, and, and Hubble from, the, or from the, 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 the sectors that are now coming into the system. So, it's really, um, uh, you know, very satisfying that we've been able to do something that helps the community. And the publications are, are, are starting to come up. Since January 1, there have been 75 papers uh, on Astro PH, and so the rate, if you extrapolate, should be of order 200 in the first year. So that's, that, so the word is definitely getting out to, that this will work out. So in the remaining time that I've got, I'd like to talk a little bit about extragalactic transients. Um, and um, this is something that we kind of knew that tests would be able to do this, but we didn't know to what extent they would. So it's, it was definitely going to be about things other than exoplanets, but we didn't know how much the balance would actually be. These are some of the time domain uh, uh, astrophysics topics that we thought we could do. If there's a check here, it means that we've already uh, had some results from that. When I say we, the community as a whole, this is certainly not something that the team itself has, has done by, on its own. But one of the things that, 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 um, that you saw that earlier plot that I showed about what the photometric precision was, that was really down in this area. But as you go fainter and fainter from 10th uh, magnitude down, um, the sensitivity that you get grows as, as the square root of the time. But the dominant uh, background contributor really is, our, our, is zodiacal light and unresolved stars. So we can get 1% photometry uh, in an hour at 16th magnitude, but if you actually say, you know, uh, go a little bit further than that, we can get a 10 sigma sensitivity at 20th magnitude. This is something that we did not realize was going to be possible, but it's basically the fact that the instrument is so stable that um, uh, if you're uh, in a place where there are no, no variations due to transmission of, of, of an overlying atmosphere or whatever, you're limited basically by the, by the physics of the of the detector process itself, and of course the uh, uh, the sky background, which is which will this this number will vary a little bit depending, of course, on, on where you are in the sky. But that's that's a that's a typical number that we're working with, and that means that we can do 10% photometry at 18th magnitude, and that that means that we're open to to uh, looking at 300 million stars and galaxies during the primary mission. So that's that's what we're really starting to appreciate. Um, and in terms of what this actually means, uh, this is a nice plot that Mansi Kaslawal put together with, with a time scale along this log axis. So um, a day is right here at 10 to the 0. And then this is uh, flux, peak luminosity along here uh, in uh, magnitude, absolute magnitudes and in ergs per second. So this is, this is sort of the, uh, the regime uh, for looking for uh, 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 transits, transients. And uh, there's the thing that you, that's, that really jumps out at you is there are areas in this plot that there are no known classes of objects, but does that really mean that there's nothing there? I, I, I think the answer is probably not. But if you look at where we can search with tests, 
uh, all the way out to the coma cluster, we can search this area very effectively, you know, where you're talking about things that have peak luminosities of more than 10 to the 40th ergs per second. If you go a little closer in, uh, Virgo, you can do that to 10 to the 40th, and then Andromeda, and then finally the LMC, which is what we're looking at all the time in this, so that you can get down into this regime here. And with the LMC, obviously, you're, you're going out much further than this because you've got a, a long time constant for the, the various sectors, but you can still expect to get down to sub-day variations uh, on relatively faint sources. So this is an example of something that we saw in the, uh, uh, in the early test observations. Uh, this is that picture that I showed you originally for purposes of, of, of orientation. And if I um, show this uh, animation, um, <clears throat> just in the first few sectors, these were the light curves that we actually saw from supernovae. And you can see we're, we're, some of them are faint and the error bars are large, but some of them we can actually see the turn on occurring. And this was, a, this was one that was traced very nicely. Now, um, TESS did not actually discover these, uh, these events. They were actually alerted by either Assassin or, or by Atlas. But then we went back and looked in the archive and then we saw there they were. We're thinking of ways that we can actually do this um, in a, you know, ab initio, but that's something that, that we're, we're having to wait on. But the bottom line is that we've already seen um, uh, 30, 53 or so of these already, and if you just take the rate at which we're seeing, this will mean about 200 supernovae in the, in the three, year, three years of the prime mission. So there's a lot that tests can actually do. And the kind of things that you can do in terms of physics, this is a another. This is that paper from uh, Michael Fastnow, that, uh, who's working in our group. That he's done a nice job. These are our plots for uh, six of those supernovae that actually show in detail what's actually happening in the initial rise. And one of the things that Michael did, which was really nice, was he actually looked at what the limitations would be from the shape of these curves if you did have a companion of various sizes, and if this is a, um, a system in which that, co that stellar companion is actually being ir irradiated from, by, the, by the supernova uh, going off, uh, and, and it would potentially cause some kind of a little bump or change in structure of that early curve, and so what, what limits could be placed. And this one right here, you can actually get a very interesting limit of, of one, uh, one solar radius. And so the uh, so from this small subsample, what we can already see is that in this initial uh, uh, two-year survey, uh, we're likely to get some that are, that are considerably brighter than this, and then we can push this number down significantly from one, uh, one solar radius. Um, and, of course, depending on the distance that it has from its companion, from the, uh, the event that actually um, uh, goes off and causes the, the supernovae. So this is this is something that I, this is an, uh, a paper that was just uh, put forward um, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it, it's a tidal disruption event that was um, generated by a supermassive black hole that was uh, observed by TESS. This is this p picture where you've got a star that comes perilously close to a supermassive black hole, and then it gets shredded, and you know of order half the material goes into an elliptical orbit and then the half of it gets dissipated out and then there's re-collisions re and, and uh, you, you expect structure in these, early, uh, in these early portions of it, but um, t no one had really looked at one of these things very early on. So this is the paper that actually reported this, um, this result uh, from um, the assassin team with uh, working in collaboration with uh, Michael and the, Michael uh, Fastenau and the test team. Uh, and the object that, that was uh, seen, it's, it's, it, it became quite bright. It got up to 15th magnitude uh, not, not after, uh, after a couple of months and a very high uh, 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 energy output. It's relatively close. And uh, so as a result of, of it being in the test continuous viewing zone, this is basically what you've got. We actually were looking at this object when we actually started the... Um, the survey back in July, and it was just this is the, the this is the coordinates of the uh, of the actual object, and then um, 
There was some burbling around, but not, nothing much would hap what happened. And then there was a then uh, because of the way the field is rotating, there was a gap in, between the chi between two chips where we didn't have data here. And then we came back, and then on January 21, this thing just took off. And then um, it was actually reported by uh, by Assassin um, in this uh, per in, in this period here, which was. Um, uh, uh, about eight days later, so it's a week or so later, and then if you zoom in on this, well, this is this is the this is the superposition of all the the uh, fields in which it was uh, in which these observations were being taken, and that's where it lies relative to the LMC. There, there's there's no association; it's it's far more distant than the uh, than the LMC, obviously. But this is what that early light curve looks like. You can see it just taking off at this point, and it follows a a t, t, a t squared uh, initial rise, and then it flattens off a little bit. And what this actually means um, in terms of the details of the of the of the power law and the fitting um, is something that's being that's being worked on. There were some comments in this uh, original paper, but you know it doesn't seem like there's a a really clear picture because this is the first time that anything like this is, has been seen. So anyway, this is, this actually shows that number that I pointed out before. We get a five sigma detection of magnitude 20.5. TESS is point from 0.6 to one micron, so it's really uh, R plus I plus Z, more or less, in terms of its uh, passband. So then the other thing that happened as a result of this being discovered so early, um, th these are the TESS observations here, there were follow-up observations with the UVOT on SWIFT and a lot of ground-based uh, spectroscopy and photometry that could take place because it, it, this was a this was a bright object, you know, it's 15th magnitude, um, and that meant that a lot of people could have, could make observations during this period of time. There was no uh, the, the the this is the uh, assassin uh, data. Um, there's questions that we're going to be the, le the next time something like this happens, we'll be looking out for any breaks in the curve or whatever. We have we at least. Now, now we know that we can get these things. That's going to be one of the things that we're going to be uh, focusing on. Now, this is another uh, plot. Um, uh, LIGO started uh, operating um, on April 1st, and this was one of the first neutron star coalescence uh, events that they reported. Um, I wish I could say, you know, TESS saw it, but on the other hand, this is where TESS uh, was actually looking. And the and the, the takeaway from this isn't necessarily that you know we we did or did not see it. We were obviously looking in a place where we could not see it, but basically we had a we have a six percent probability of seeing any one of these events when they actually go off. And so if you do the numbers uh, for binary neutron star coalescences, uh, if if the rate does appear to be about one event per month from um, from O3 of of LIGO and Virgo then we can expect to see about two of these uh, 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 events in which we have a test overlap just as, you know, as the mission goes on. And this is largely due to this large field of view. So the, the prime mission is, is what all this data is coming from. In fact, it's just this portion down here that we really have been looking at. When we flip over and go to the north in, uh, later on this summer, We'll see the test, the Kepler field, as well as a number of other areas that we're going to be looking at, and then in the extended mission, what we're proposing to do, this would be um, starting in uh, in, uh, in 2020, the last quarter of 2020. Then we'll 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 uh, do something that's a little more complex. We'll go back and we'll we'll do another exposure, an extended uh, uh, exposure of the northern sky building on to what we had from this previous 12 months. And then um, we're, we'll, we'll, we'll go back and do the south again with a, with, a, uh, two, with a two year separation. And then we're going to go over and do the ecliptic. And, we, and in just this relatively short period of time, we can do about three quarters of the ecliptic. So we'll be able to go back in a, in a relatively short time and uh, check uh, all of the K2 uh, events that were uh, that were reported and 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 more. So that's that's going to be a, a valuable thing for us. So if you combine the two of these things in the extended mission um, out to uh, the end of, of 2020, this is where we'll basically uh, be able to to do. So we'll have covered 94% um, of the sky. So that's uh, that's that's going to be one of the goals in that period of time. 
The other thing that will happen in the extended mission, that's what this, these orange plots are. These are planet radius and orbital period along here. The blue is for the prime mission, orange is for the extended mission. You, what, what we see is we will more than double the number of planets that we'll actually be able to detect because there, there are two things that are occurring. One is you know, the exposure time is increased by a factor of two. That would mean 1.4 times. But the other thing is it'll bring objects which are um, at marginal uh, levels of, of detection up. And we, we have reasons to believe from the way that the, the modeling goes that that's going to produce, that, that, that'll promoting things that are five sigma to, to seven sigma detections will result in this increase in the, in the detection rate. So that's the, uh, so we'll get a 250% a increase in the, especially for longer period planets, which we, we're, we're not seeing as many of those because of the observation strategy that we have for the prime mission. So these are the kinds of things that we'll be finding um, in, the, uh, in the observations that we're making. Longer period planets, we're going to revisit the prime mission planets to refresh the ephemerides because um, even though we're, we've made uh, observations of a large portion of the sky, um, uh, if we can get a few more transits, that'll mean we can extrapolate into the future. In fact, we've made some estimates uh, that will actually improve the period of time that we can extrapolate the, the ephemerides by, by about a factor of 30. So it means if we make these observations in these two um, two intervals, the primary mission and the extended mission, we should be able to extend those out to the time of Habex and Louvoir, for, for that matter. So there, there's, there's lots of reasons to do that. Um, and then the other thing that's going to be happening during this period of time, here's here are the primary and the extended mission. If you look at all the other um, uh, interesting uh, new facilities that are coming online, uh, Erosita, Kiops, uh, web when it comes online, and here's LIGO transitioning to four. Then you, if you project this down for those two missions, uh, LSST will be starting up. So these are all things that TESS will be able to operate in collaboration with. So this is this is sort of um, a summary of what I've tried to share today, and and I, I think you know um, I I couldn't be happier, and I don't think the team could be any any happier with the way that this has all turned out. And so we're we're looking for more and more interesting things to find and lots more fun for everybody. Thank you. You could solve the world's unemployment problem if you had the money. Just anal train them to analyze test data. Well, the, uh, the thing I did mention that in which people are actually doing doing things that are all in that same line of the, the planet hunters and the, and the citizen scientists are having a glorious time with the data. There's, yeah. uh, there's uh, 2,500 people that Susan Brown has organized, and there's something like a, a, a several thousand others. The, the, the um, the AAVSO is a, is a major player in all this. So everyone's having a, having a great time. Because the things that you can do with the test data are the same things that astronomers do with uh, images that they're accustomed to working with. They're just very, they're, they're like, you and I remember this, they're like these Schmidt plates where when you look at the, at the Palomar Sky Survey and you'd, you'd sit there and you'd, you'd, you'd find interesting objects or whatever and, and uh, with, this, with the software and the tools that people currently have, it's all there for the paper. My actual questions were different. Sure. On yes. NEOs, have you discovered any NEO that comes We, we have there? not. Yeah. Um, in, there is a, an expectation from the Southern <laughs> survey that's just now completed that we may be able to get a count. But my understanding from talking to Matt Holman is in order for that to be really useful, you've got to, to provide the data uh, for that for for follow-up purposes within a couple of days. And we're working on a strategy for how we can actually do that uh, so to make that available to the, to the, to the, uh, um, the, search, the people who are interested in carrying out those searches. And the last short question was, on the supernovae, you might discover some of them first. Do you have any automatic way of telling when, this, when there's been a, you know, a 
exceeding some threshold of change from observation. observation. Carrie Howard is smiling at this because she wrote the uh, firmware for tests before she came here to work at, at SAO. We have we have plans for doing that, and they, and uh, uh, and Carrie actually Carrie actually actually put the uh, the hooks in the software that we can do that later on. That's that's a, a, a process that we're that we're planning to undertake. I was just curious, why did you start from the southern sky? <coughs> you know, there are more observatories in the north, Kepler mm -hmm. is in the north. I would have thought that's where you would start. Well, there was, there was a lot of uh, uh, discussion about what, what was the right thing to do in that, in that area. Um, one thing that I can say, there, there were actually, there's one good reason, well, actually there are two good reasons, but one, there was one obvious reason. We we relied uh, in the uh, in the planning that we had, that we had made uh, to use um, uh, the Las Cumbres Observatory network, and the only two at the time we were, were, were we were reaching that part of the planning, they only had the uh, the the uh, facility in South Africa and in Chile operating. There were none working well in, in the northern hemisphere, so we had to go. This was uh, this was a couple of years before launch, and that part of the planning got loose. Uh, got done. Um, the other factor was um, it turns out operationally that uh, w with with the way the you, we had to make, we had to choose where we could have the orbit inclined toward the north or to the south, and it it turned out that with the geometry of the orbit uh, we had less we had fewer problems with scattered light if we uh, operated with the with the south first. Um, so my but my particular take on this is. Um, Let's, let's work in a way that's simplest first, and then when, when it comes around to the northern hemisphere and we got all those observatories, um, uh, it'll be a lot easier to, to marshal all the resources. And you know, if, if Harvey's in the, uh, in, the, in the audience, he will tell you that the first year of any mission is hell, and you want to make sure if you're going to get the primary science that you get that, um, that you optimize things for the second year. So we were actually thinking ahead on that school. So you mentioned um, maybe hundreds of terabytes being downloaded. Is that is that all full frame images? Is there a, is there a plan for like a light curve service? Um, yeah, there there is the, the 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 amount of data that comes that, that we can download in any single contact is about 180 gigabytes. Um, the, that doesn't sound like very much, but it turns out. But the test data, because you're you're looking so stably at the sky, it compresses to an incredible degree. Uh, something that uh, Huffman encoding um, and uh, you know something equivalent to JPEG means that we go from 16 bits um, down to uh, four bits. So there's a four times compression, and then um, so that, so basically that means that we can optimize the use of the on, of the onboard recorder. Uh, the the, um, the the other thing is that uh, for uh, the the actual uh, dis distribution of the data, which may be what you're talking about, uh, that is something we still have to go through and and um, and uh, produce pits images from the from the, the packets that come. And the, the limited the amount of time that that take that will take at an absolute minimum is somewhere it's going to be some, somewhere in the one or two days period. So that's really We'll, we can't expect to ever do any better than that. The contact schedule takes normally five hours to bring the data down at Perigee, and then you know, the way the DSN is scheduled, we wait 20 hours and then we do it again, because sometimes the DSN doesn't get it right the first time and we have to do a second contact, so we just have to schedule all those things as we go along. It looked like the Falcon Shroud was much excessive to, to your little satellite. Why didn't they? Why did they make it so big? They've only why got, didn't you put other things in there as well, CubeSats, and let everything go? Okay. Well, there's two <laughs> two different answers uh, for that. One is um, the they only make one size. Oh, so, okay. <laughs> and then the other reason is if you add anything in, that, yeah, that, you get then, trouble. Then, well, schedule problems, but also who wants to be in this crazy orbit uh, <laughs> except us? Because then you have to do the you have to do the phasing and all. Had that, that. orbit ever been used before? No. Uh -uh. It's the first so time. 
did you sleep well for the first <laughs> well, I, I, was, I, was sat I was satisfied with the, with the concept of the orbit you know, way back in 2013. Yeah. The thing we were surprised by, and, and we knew from the, from the analyses that had, been, that had been done, that we could get into that orbit, because there was a lot of study of that. The thing we didn't realize is how well it, it was done. The, 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 typically, the, um, the uh, x dot, y dot, z dot, and, and x, y, z um, values that um, uh, the Falcon 9 achieved were 10 times better than what we expected that yeah. they would be. And then the hydrazine burns were, uh, were unbelievable. We were, things that we thought would be in the meter per second range were in the centimeters per second range. And they just did it very efficiently. So, the, uh, you know, we but, were and now are astro seismologists using this data as well? They are. I didn't mention. A, I, didn't know. I, I, I didn't. There's a huge uh, effort yeah. uh, by the uh, by the that's organized by the folks at Arbus and, and right. Christian Zadowski. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and that's good. that's a good. big that's a big good, group. Good. Yeah. In fact, what I should do is also make an advertisement. There's going to be two uh, successive weeks of conferences related to tests. Uh, this summer, uh, from mid-July to the 1st of, uh, of August, the first week will be devoted to astro seismology, and the second one will be uh, uh, test uh, observations in general. And both these conferences will be uh, at MIT, and some of the people who were so active in organizing the Cool Stars conference so effectively are helping us uh, set that up. So that's a that's a great that'll be that's a thank you for. <laughs> so, so is there any questions from upstairs? No? Sorry, I have to put you in the spot. Um, has Spitzer been of any use for follow-up? Um, uh, it has been. This is, there's been a program that a number of people, including Ian Crossfield, have, have had. Um, uh, I don't know exactly what results have come from that yet, but there have been observations already made. And there are many more that are that are scheduled. Well, you know, notwithstanding how long the commission is going to be able to operate. Given how stable the observatory is, and how many passes it'll do, and how much integration time there will be, are there plans for doing a low surface brightness studies? We have actually done a little bit of that. Um, the uh, if you if you go through the numbers formally, you should be able to get down to the 32 to 34 magnitudes per square arc second range with the data. You've got the problem. There are two 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 problems that we're going to run into. One is uh, you've got to subtract out the stars, and we're and the data is fairly coarsely pixelated, so it's not a trivial t um, task to do. But the data is there, and I'm sure that, that someone will be able to work on it. There's been um, there was a, a little short paper on astro pH uh, by someone from the I think from the University of Louisville who proposed doing this, but he but they but he did a comparison between what um, tests would be able to do in the ground-based facilities, and it looks very promising. So, so it's definitely it's it's not it's not simple. We 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 stacked some images like that and looked at them, and it's it's going to be hard, but it can be done. Okay, we have time for one more question. If there's no more questions, I have an announcement to make. The colloquium organizers asked me to tell you that the, ne uh, the last colloquium for the season is next week. And Chef Dolman is going to be talking about the results of the, uh, <laughs> the, um, the event present. Oh, so yeah. so it's, it is not going to be here. It's going to be down at the same center on campus oh, because we expect so many people that we cannot be there. Mm -hmm. So just keep that in mind. Where is it going to be? Science Center? Today it's home in the Science Center 8. 8. Yes. That's small. Yeah, that's a small one. So the that's that's small. Small. There might be an email going out next week saying, B, I don't know. <laughs> but, but that's uh, you know. yeah. So with that, with that said, let's thank. Uh, thank you.